Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this BSA mm -hmm. webinar hosted and presented by BDO on CRR2, CRD5. We're broadcasting from various um, rooms in houses across London. Um, and if you thought you'd tuned into the shopping channel or Netflix, you need to retune your set now because this is the BSA webinar. Um, in fact, it's the second webinar we've uh, had the privilege of hosting with BDO. Uh, we've got one more coming up in a couple of weeks. And um, I'm delighted to have today Eivind Anderson to unpack the mysteries of CRR2, CRD5, and also to mention behind the scenes, the mistress of ceremonies, Lauren Hughes, who is expertly um, organizing all the admin and all the admission to let you into the site and making sure everything goes fine, but you can't see her. She's um, doing it expertly from her kitchen and uh, doing it very well. A Couple of quick housekeeping things before I hand over. Um, as we're expecting over a hundred participants uh, in this session, um, as you know, you won't be either visible or audible. Everybody's muted throughout. Um, otherwise there would be cacophony. Uh, so to ask questions, please use the Q&A function, uh, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. You send, you send the questions, I can see them. I will put them to Ovind as we go through um, at, at, at the appropriate time. So if there's something that needs unpacking as we go through, we'll do it then. Otherwise there'll be some time at the end for all the questions. So that's the methodology for questions. Um, we are going to be recording in a moment. Lauren will be will switch on record, so the uh, session will be recorded. And sometime next week, we hope that the whole thing will then be available to, like, watch on catch up uh, if you want to. I think that's all the housekeeping I need to mention. Um, and to avoid distraction, I'm now going to take a back seat in my alter ego as the Red Panda, and I'm going to hand over to Ovind to. Go. Thanks very much, Ovind. Over to you. Well, thank you very much, Jeremy, uh, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to this um, uh, 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 we webinar on CRR2 and CRD5. Um, my name is uh, Ovind Anderson, and I'm a director of BDO, um, and I specialise very much in regulatory reporting uh, uh, and liquidity and capital man management. So I have many years' experience in dealing with uh, regulatory queries and uh, uh, with um, things like re regulatory reporting uh, um, across a wide range of banks, investment firms, and also building societies. Um, and what I want to talk you through today is to give, really give you an overview of um, the CRR2 uh, and CRRD5 changes that we'll see come in. Uh, 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 we'll actually, some of it's already started and it will move on to the next uh, 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 sort of year, year or so. Um, and give you an insight into what that practical would, you know, would mean for building societies, both in terms of, I guess, the capital impact, but also in terms of regulatory reporting. So I just listed out there on the agenda some of the topics that we will um, explore uh, during this morning's um, uh, sessions. If we move on to the kind of the overview and, and timeline, which is, is on my next slides here, we'll see that there's been, you know, a variety of regulations coming in since uh, uh, sort of CRR2, R, R, R which culminated with CRR2, went live uh, and entered into force last year, 2019. And then in parallel with that, we also have something called the backstop regulation, which entered in uh, 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 into force on the, on, in April 2019. And the way the, I guess, the European U Union works, and although the UK is no, no longer a, you know, a member, the, you know, the way these rules work is that they will apply from the 28th of June 2021. And the UK is very much expected to implement these, although that's not sort of formally yet been confirmed. So some of the CRR stuff, you know, is due to go live next year, but we can't for certain say that actually the UK will, will implement it exactly, although that's very much the, the, the expectations. And I think that the PRA has alluded to that in uh, uh, in a couple of, of, of um, consultation papers, uh, CP12, 20, and 17, 20, where, where they basically have set out their approach to CRD5 and CRR2. So I very much 
recommend some of you for those, those of you who have time to have a look at those. And the EBA has also published uh, uh, a couple of sort of consultation papers on, on, um, on the kind of the technical standards behind the CRR2. Uh, and there's quite a lot of that that we will base this, this, this presentation on. Um, and I think separate, separately as well, uh, um, back in June uh, uh, this year, as a result uh, uh, from, from the uh, sort of coronavirus pandemic, the EBA decided to accelerate some of the implementation of CRR2, and that's referred to as the quick fix. So I'll cover that as well separately. But I think that you know very very much from a timeline perspective is what 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 we'll see with with uh, uh, CRR two and CRD five is that by June next year it will all sort of be packed up and you know and ready to go with some of the stuff um, of, of already being in force. And so 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 there are some real uh, changes here for firms to look out for. Um, and if we look at the the sort of CRR uh, uh, quick fix as you know as a regulators you know refer to. Um, that came in uh, as a response to the COVID-19 uh, uh, and, and kind of and, and the regulators see exactly what can we do sort of to help banks given given the kind of the impact the pandemic will have on 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 um, on banks and uh, and I guess sort of you know building societies as well uh, uh, to you know to support them you know during this pan in a pandemic and and there was really three things that uh, uh, the quick fix you know, uh, focused on, um, it was really just to, to sort of accelerate the implementation of, uh, of three items. The first one was around SME and infrastructure. So there's a new SME supporting factor for an, an infrastructure uh, 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 exposure. So basically, um, if you have an exposure to, uh, to, you know, to SMEs, to small, medium-sized enterprises and to infrastructure exposures, you will get a revise supporting factor. So effectively a discount on your capital requirement. I'll come back to that in a second, what, you know, what that will look like. Uh, the regulators also decided to switch off uh, 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 capital deductions for certain software assets from, you know, from, from CE to one capital. Uh, on the 14th of October this year, uh, the EBA pub published some further guidance on that, exactly what type of software assets, et cetera, uh, that no long, longer requires you know, deduction. So what happens instead is that there will be a risk weight at 100% as opposed to, you know, to, you know, to be deducted. So uh, you know, a small saving that for some firms. And then also, uh, uh, finally, what the uh, regulators have done. So those of you who are on uh, IFRS 9, the regulators have reset the, uh, um, the transitional arrangement for, 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 for IFRS 9 expected loss provision. So effectively the add back uh, um, uh, you know, is now a reset at 100%. Uh, um, I, th I think it was actually due to expire this year uh, uh, and it's ex been extended all the way to 2024, uh, you know, where uh, it goes down to 25%. So it uh, 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 makes it a bit easier for firms to, 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 you know, to undertake the um, transition if you are on IFRS 9. So that's the quick fix. If we then move on to um, another key area of focus for for um, for for you know for for uh, for CRD5 and I guess in CRR is around non-performing loans. So um, there's a couple of of, of key changes around uh, non-performing loans. There's uh, the regulators have introduced something called the backstop regulation. So this is where basically uh, uh, um, you know they they require a prudential backstop. Uh, 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 to the coverage of non-performing uh, uh, exposures in the form of a minimum coverage uh, uh, requirement. So, for example, if a non-performing loan is not covered by the minimum amount, then you need to deduct the difference from C to one. So, basically, they're putting in the floor for uh, 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 for non-performing non, non, non loans. And the way the, this uh, sort of backstop regulation is calculated is that this uh, minimum requirement is equal to your exposure value multiplied by a coverage requirement factor. And this factor is based on the time unsecured uh, um, um, and the bucket secured versus unsecured and security type. 
um, uh, and I'll have an example of that in a second, how, you know, how, you know, how that's calculated. And uh, with this new requirement, there are also three new templates coming into our, our, uh, our uh, you know, your, um, uh, I guess your co, your co rep suite of return. So there's templates 3501, 0203, basically where you have to analyze your, um, your non-performing loans requirements. That's will apply to all firms, uh, you know, when this will go live next year. And if we look here at, um, at uh, you know, an actual example, just, just to show you how um, uh, uh, a um, uh, uh, you know this backs up value will you know will be calculated. There's a, there's a few things to you know to you know to go through. Uh, so for example, if you have an exposure value of one million, so you have a loan for say of one million, um, and it's unsecured and it's been non-performing for three and a half years, and then ten percent of it has been has since been you know written off. The factor. Which I talked about earlier is therefore 0 0.35, and that's basically the exposure being unsecured uh, uh, and the time bucket. So it's it's it it's it you know just effectively multiply the two, um, and then uh, uh, what you then do is you calculate something called the C value, which is the um, which the you know which is the the, the I guess it's sort of uncapped adjustment. So that's what you have already have provided for. In this instance, it is hundred thousand because you've al already written that off. So therefore, your MCE value, so the minimum uh, uh, coverage requirement, is is um, is uh, three hundred fifty thousand uh, a million times that uh, uh, F factor zero point thirty five. Uh, and therefore, your total provisions and adjustment, and you know, or deductions, is limited to the limited to uh, the minimum of three hundred fifty thousand and hundred thousand. So, in this instance, the uh, the applicable amount of insufficient coverage is the three hundred fifty thousand minus a hundred thousand. So, and therefore, you'll then have to you know to deduct two hundred fifty thousand. From um, you know from CET one for you know for that particular exposure. So this, so this will actually have an impact for some firms. Uh, you know if you're not done your your uh, uh, um, your uh, non-performing loan you know, pro, you know provisioning correctly. So that's the the um, just a non non-performing non, non loan. There are also some additional changes to. Um, Ivan, could, could yes. we just ask, what, take one question on the non-performing loans templates, which has yes. come up through the Q&A. Yes. Um, uh, one of our uh, colleagues has asked, the new returns for the, not, for the NPLs, uh, her understanding was that these were not applicable for smaller firms. Can you just confirm whether, in your view, that's the case? Yes, that, yeah, that's right. There's a, there, I think there's a specific threshold on that, Jeremy, uh, which I don't know at the top of my head, but I've heard that you you're absolutely right. It's not uh, applicable to all firms. Is, is it based on size of firm or is it based on how, how high your NPLs are? I think it's based on the size of your firm asset value. Okay. But I think that's something we, you know, we, can, you know, we can confirm offline, but that, yeah, I'm yeah. pretty sure it's, it's, you know, it's asset value. So thank, okay, thank, thanks. Thank, thanks for the question. Uh, if we move on to own funds charges, uh, 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 sorry, sorry, changes. Um, there are a few changes as well on the own fund side. We already talked about, um, you know, you know deductions. Uh, uh, so this is around the non-performing loans, software assets I mentioned, and also the transitional provisions. Um, and what the regulators have also done uh, is that they have um, a requested further breakdowns and memorandum items to the, uh, uh, you know, to you know, you know, to the own funds template. Um, so, for example. Uh, um, you know, they require more information around, uh, 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 you know, sort of the surplus or deficit of CT1, uh, and, 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 you know, so it's a little bit more of um, analysis required there. Uh, and they're also, thankfully, uh, uh, taking stuff off some of the, the, um, the own funds templates, for example, the Basel 1 floor, uh, um, and some of the uh, expired transitional provisions have now been removed from the template. So, yeah, there are some additions, but there are also stuff that they've taken off, which I think is great, makes it a bit easier. Uh, if we move on to um, credit risk, so credit risk is another key area where there are changes into 
uh, um, you know, into, in, you know, into the re you know, re regulatory re reporting space. Um, and I think that probably the key ones here, uh, uh, which I think will also apply to some, some building societies, uh, uh, you know, particularly if you're in sort of the, the, the you know, lending into, um, uh, you know, commercial exposures, this, that, for, for infrastructure assets, uh, uh, which are defined as uh, finance or operate fiscal structures or facilities that provide or support essential pub, you know, public services, for example, a hospital. Uh, if you lend to, um, uh, uh, you know, to these type of exposures, then you can apply a, uh, a 0.75 supporting factor to your, um, to your uh, 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 you know, your capital requirements. So effectively, you will get a discount. Um, the um, and the uh, the um, the same applies to 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 I guess to SMEs, so small and medium sized enterprises, whether now. You know, there's been some further uh, um, extension to the uh, you know supporting factors. So now, if you have an exposure less than two and a half million euros, I think that was previously one million euro, you have a zero point seven six one nine supporting factor, which I guess some you will recognise. And if you have SME exposures greater than two and a half million euros, then you'll have a a, a zero point eighty five supporting factor. So. There's uh, 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 some benefit there if you are into the sort of SME or infrastructure lending, um, and you'll see that um, uh, 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 current template CO7 uh, is updated to capture this new change. Um, and also, if you look in CRR2, uh, you'll find these references in Article 501, 501C. So, uh, 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 a small a credit risk benefit there for firms having exposures to, 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 you know, to SMEs and in, in infrastructure. I, Ivind, yes. do, these only, do these only come in next June? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. we're still waiting to see if PRA yes. go with them. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, and there's also a couple of other um, changes or, or I guess confirmations. I think the, the first one here, the collective investment units, uh, are probably less relevant to building societies, but there's a way they, uh, there's a change to what they um, uh, do have for the calculation of risk weighted assets. So the specific new calculation for, 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 um, for uh, collective investment units, and uh, uh, which I think can even end up with a 1,050% risk weighting potentially. Um, and there are new uh, standardized templates uh, updated to you know to you know to reflect that. Uh, but from what my experience with building societies is probably less relevant for you. Um, I think what the regulators and the PRA has confirmed in the their um, in their latest uh, consultation paper is very much that they continue. They want to continue to to treat. Uh, uh, um, uh, commercial re real estate exposures uh, uh, at 100% risk weighting. So CRR2, uh, as CRR uh, um, uh, did, uh, uh, both confirm that it's possible to have 50% risk weighting for commercial real estate exposures. However, local regulators uh, uh, can, um, um, can change that to a more conservative uh, risk weight if they want to, and the PRA has very much confirmed that they will continue to uh, 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 treat commercial real estate exposures at um, at a hundred percent. So no change there really. Just the PRA has just gone in and confirmed that uh, because they think uh, a fifty percent risk weight will adversely um, uh, sort of affect the financial stability of you know in the, you know in the UK. So that's some of the. Um, the, the, I guess, the kind of key themes for, for credit risk. In terms of reporting, so if you are on IRB, uh, 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 and I believe some building societies are on IRB, uh, there are some new templates uh, that have been included in the, in, you know, in, you know, in, the, um, in the reporting. And so you see that there's, that I think there's about five templates, you know, starting from CO803 and going up to CO807. Um, this is really just uh, uh, to provide uh, the regulators with, you know, with better, I guess, guidance, uh, 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 validation rules, you know, etc. To, you know, to, you know, to make make it easier for them to understand, uh, you know, the IRB calculations. For example, C803, you know, requires you to 
provide more parameters for your calculation of credit risk capital requirements for your model. The more detailed breakdown of things like uh, you know EAD and your PDs, etc., LGD uh, uh, and so on, and uh, and and CO eight o five for example uh, talks about back testing of PDs, etc. So you can see where 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 the regulator really comes from is that they just want to have more data to you know sort of you know, to review firms uh, IRB models and they're using. Um, they're using the code templates to capture that. Um, um, so I think if you're on 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 IRB, this will be a, a you know a key change for you. Um, there are also some some changes uh, around counterparty credit risk, and and for those of you uh, uh, um, uh, you know who work in things like you know treasury etc., uh, you, you know that counterparty credit risk uh, uh, um, you know, plays uh, I guess uh, a, a sort of key part in treasury management. However, uh, most building societies wouldn't necessarily have a trading book uh, and wouldn't have you know, huge amounts of counterparty credit risk. So this wouldn't impact you in a huge detail. Although there are some, you know, some changes to the, to the, um, you know, to the uh, uh, um, counterparty credit risk that would impact, I guess, all firms that report counterparty credit risk. The um, regulators uh, 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 have introduced something called SACCR, which is the new approach for um, for um, you know for counterparty credit risk. Uh, I think it's important to notice though that if you have you know derivative positions equal or less than ten percent of your total assets and three hundred uh, a million euros, you can use the simplified uh, 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 approach. Uh, so not a huge change. However, even if you use the simplified um, uh, um, uh, approach, uh, uh, you know, you will still, uh, uh, you know, have to do more than what you do today. Um, so, for example, they're adding, uh, as you see right in the sort of to the bottom right of the slide, you have, uh, you know, some additional uh, uh, calculation steps to add. So things like supervisory delta, supervisory duration, and so on. Uh, uh, so that would be a bit more, uh, more, uh, uh, you know, challenge if you have. Uh, um, if you have, if, if you're using the simplified method, um, I think, however, for for quite a few building societies that have very have very small uh, counterparty credit risk positions, you are still allowed to use the uh, uh, what they call the OEM methods or the original exposure method, uh, and this is permitted if your derivative positions are equal to less than 100 million uh, uh, euros. So, 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 I think quite a few firms can still. Uh, use the uh, uh, can use the OEM methods, the original exposure methods, as you do at the moment. So I think that's all I wanted to say about uh, you know counter you know party credit risk. So if you are on the OEM method, there wouldn't be a change. But if you uh, uh, use uh, things like the current exposure methods uh, and have less than three hundred million euros, you're likely to end up using the simplified method, which is a little bit more complicated. Although from from some of the banks that I work with uh, uh, and are in this space, they haven't seen a huge impact of this. Um, so nothing really to worry about per se, but I think it's useful just to understand what these changes are. Um, if we move on to some of the other changes that we've seen, um, uh, and this is around the leverage ratio. Um, so I guess the uh, leverage ratio you know, has been around I guess as part, you know, partly around uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, since um, uh, uh, Basel III and, 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 and CRE IV came in, um, you know, six years ago now, but it's sort of still not sort of been fully implemented. So what's happened now is that in the European Union, the, 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 the um, you know, the regulators confirmed that the kind of the 3% tier one leverage ratio requirement applies to all institutions in the European Union from June 2021. Um, I think what we've seen with, you know, as we all know, with the UK, the PRA has all, all, already set their own requirement for, for you know, for, uh, for firms with respect to leverage ratio, which really sort of uh, uh, aligns to that 3%, so with no change for firms as such. Um, but the regulators just confirm uh, uh, the, car, the, you know, the calculation of that, um, and also they specify uh, a number of potential exclusions from the exposure measure. measure. So this is around 
you know, you can, if you have, for example, you know, deducted exposures from CET1, you don't have to report them as a, as a leverage ratio exposure. If, if you have uh, zero percent risk weighted assets, again, you can exclude it from your, you know, your exposure, uh, um, and you can. And national competent authorities can, in exceptional circumstances, uh, uh, um, uh, exclude, uh, uh, you know, exposures to central banks. Um, so, that's, so that's another provision there. Um, I think when it comes to, um, to the uh, uh, leverage ratio, there's a couple of new templates here, uh, C4801 and C4802, they, you know, they've been added. Uh, and, and, and this is for large institutions. Again, I don't think it's, ne it's necessary, uh, 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 will, you know, will impact uh, building societies, but, you know, they, they, um, they are just called out uh, uh, um, some more details on how you calculate the averages. So what I have here on the next slide is just I've, I've summarized the um, the uh, leverage reporting uh, templates and you know for, for you know for leverage, so you can see basically what you have to deal with going forward. So C40, the template I think you're all familiar with, uh, uh, they've tried to simplify that a bit, which is good. C41 and C42 has now been removed. Um, they, uh, um, uh, uh, there's been some changes to C43 and C44. So, uh, uh, you know, trying to, you know, to, you know, to standardize it. C47, this is now the main calculation template for the, you know, for the new leverage ratio. Uh, uh, and that's sort of been significantly updated. Um, so again, it's nothing sort of fundamentally new here. It's just that they, they, they just, re you know, refresh the, refresh the template and having some, uh, um, you know some, you know some additional clarity in, you know, of the key sta uh, steps that you need to report. And C forty eight a one and a two, as I said earlier, that's a new template for monitoring this, and you know, around the volatility and the averages. That's only for larger firms. Ivan, there's just sorry, sorry to break in. There's just one further question that's come up from the uh, from the delegates, which I think is useful to knock on the head just at this point. Yeah, because uh, it's a really important one on the leverage ratio. So the question is, is there any further clarity around whether PRA intends to apply the CRR2 leverage to all firms or just retain the current UK leverage rules where they only apply to the very largest firms, more than 50 billion retail deposits? So in our sector, for example, only Nationwide has to observe the leverage ratio at the moment and all the other building societies only report it through COREP, but it's not a pillar one requirement for them. So the question is, will, will PRA Given that it comes in under CRR2 in June, it's not automatic. Do we know whether PRA is saying either way what they're going to do? That I don't think that's a really good question, David. I don't think that, that there's that there's sort of been any specific uh, uh, guidance, uh, 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 you know, there from the PRA. I think my expectation will be that it will be, uh, I think, reportable, uh, um, you know, for you know for CoRep, you know, continue to do that. Uh, uh, and I have this sort of sneaking feeling that they're putting a three percent floor uh, sort of as a pillar one requirement. But yeah, but I haven't seen any details on that yet. So I think that's uh, I think that's something we we, we I, th um, I think one thing we know from past experience is that quite independently of the EU, yeah, the Bank of England and the PRA love the leverage ratio. Yeah. So I can't imagine they'll pass up the opportunity to apply it more widely. No. There is a certain amount of pushback because we have. With the BSA has opposed rolling it out to everybody and said that's not a good idea. Yeah, I'm not sure whether we're going to win that argument, but I think right. it's wait, wait and see at the moment. Yes, no, no, I think so. But I, I think my personal view is that I think they'll probably that three that three percent will apply to everyone eventually. I think that's what I, you know, I have the feeling. Like I say, okay. you know, you know, they, you know, they do love it, and and uh, and and I think they do, you know, challenge some firms. Uh, uh, you know, on it, particularly where there's a big difference between, I guess, exposures and risk-weighted assets. Mm. So you can actually have quite a healthy capital ratio, but perhaps, you know, you have a lot of exposures. So, 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 where, so it's basically, lever you know, leverage. So, 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 so I, I can see that, uh, uh, um, you know, and, and even if they don't put it in as a pillar one, they may, you know, challenge firms in, you know, in their mm. cap around pillar two. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and you know potentially things like add-ons. I think there's provisions for that as well. So yeah, I don't think it will go away, unfortunately. But we 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 shall wait and see.
Okay, um, let's move on to uh, uh, interest rate risk in the banking book. So interest rate risk in the banking book. Um, uh, so again, I think that's a concept now that's familiar, uh, you know, to most building societies. You all do your FSA um, uh, 17 uh, uh, reporting, um, and you uh, uh, obviously cover it in your um, your um, your um, uh, ICAPs. So the PRA has very much said that they don't want to uh, implement the RB5. Uh, requirement on IRRBB, and this is because uh, uh, they do not need to be complied with by firms until after the transition period ends. Basically, because they go, um, they go live in 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 June 2021. This is after the transition period. So, what the PRA proposes instead is to implement the BCBS, so the Basel Committee, is uh, uh, IRBB standard directly into the PRA rule 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 book. Um, and they will include those requirements that CRD5 was due to implement from the end of the transition period. So I think that's just a roundabout way of saying that rather, rather than going uh, sort of directly from, you know, via CRD5, they just take the BCBS requirements and, and you know, and then update them that way. Um, I think these, these requirements around um, IRBB are not sort of fundamentally different to what you uh, do at the moment as firms. Um, there's a key couple of key things there to call out, and then, then for example, uh, you, know, you need to clarify your firm's sort of identification, evaluation, and management of IRBB systems, and you need to cover kind of the the the, 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 the changes impacting the economic value of your non-trading activities and and related earnings. So they expect firms to 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 basically incorporate uh, uh, um, I guess the monitoring and management of IRBB into your 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 core system. So I think for some some smaller building scientists it will be you know very very easy. But I think you nevertheless need to do it in your uh, uh, ICAP and you know have that as part of your your process. Um, and the requirements also set you know explicit requirements to monitor and assess credit spread risk from non trading activities. And I think again for firms, this wouldn't be a be a very huge requirement, uh, and I wouldn't expect any specific add-ons for that over and above what you have in your FSA 17 returns. They, um, the BCBS rules also uh, uh, um, introduce something called an outlier test. This is where you compare the uh, maximum charge in the firm's EAB with 15% of your tier one capital uh, under specific interest rate shock scenarios. And then they also specify uh, governance requirements for IRBB risk appetite and risk management. So for example, they expect all firms to have a risk appetite for uh, uh, interest rate risk in the banking book. As I said earlier, but although it may be very, very simple, you'll still need uh, that. If you move on to the next slide, there's a couple of more things uh, I wanted to call out on interest rate risk in the banking book. So the PRA has said that they, they don't really expect any change to firms pillar 2A assessment for IRBB. Um, so I think it's very much sort of going on as you are at the moment where they basically look at your FSA 17 template and use that as a way to, to you know, to assess your, your pillar 2A assessment, at least for the, or I guess for the, for, for the uh, you know, for most building societies. I think some of the very, very big ones, you have more complex uh, IRBB calculations and models, but you know, for most other firms uh, 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 and building societies, it will be um, it will be around the FSA 17 uh, calculation. Uh, however, the PRA may ask uh, you for some additional data, particularly for this BCBS outlier test, if they deem that's relevant for your firm. But I think again, for smaller building societies, I don't think this will be particularly relevant. Um, and in terms of reporting, say the uh, PRA has said that the FSA 17 will, you know, will very much continue as it is today, uh, uh, but they are looking to potentially re you know, revise that to ensure that it has all the relevant uh, data it needs for IRBB assessment. So this is in, you know, including calculating EVA, et cetera. So there will be some, some, some you know, potentially some changes there, but I think for most firms that I, I work with sort of in the wider banking sector. There's no one particularly wor worried about this uh, and don't think it will have any impact. It's more making sure that you're formalizing the governance requirement, et cetera, having the risk appetite and so on. Uh, 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 so it's good to, to, you know, to 
you know, to look at the PRS guidance for this and see actually do we meet all the requirements at the moment, not, not just from a capital impact perspective, but from a sort of a governance and risk management perspective. Um, also, I want to touch on, um, on, large, on, large, on large exposures. So um, CR, uh, uh, CRR2 uh, um, makes some changes to large, large exposures as well. Uh, I think a key one, uh, uh, um, and this is particularly relevant for firms that uh, uh, um, you know, have, you know, are in sort of in the commercial uh, lending space, uh, uh, and also for firms that have you know, large exposures you know, to counterparties, including banks, for example, is that the, um, the eligible capital figure uh, that's currently being used to calculate the large exposures, that is it's now being replaced by uh, just tier one capital. But the eligible capital in the past was basically a, 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 a combination of, of, of tier one capital and sort of parts of tier two capital. So basically, if you have a lot of tier two capital, you can no longer recognize part of that for, you know, as eligible capital. I think that we, that's quite important for some firms, Pro, probably not so much in the building society space, but you know, if you have, for example, a lot of tier two capital and you have a, 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 you know, some large exposures, then, then, yeah, that, then that will definitely impact you. Um, and there's also some changes to the reporting requirements. So for example, if you have exposures greater than or equal to 300 million euros, but less than 10, 10% of your tier one capital, you have to report those as large exposures. The, um, and what's happened uh, as well is that the C30 and C31 templates have been removed. Um, the um, the uh, regulators have also uh, uh, made some changes to, um, to, to, you know, to the large exposures templates. They call it streamlining. The C27 template you know, now has the you know, identification of counterparties in it, um, you know, C28. Uh, 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 you know, has, has, has also been updated and same with C29. So, uh, um, you know, it's just making them more, more clear. So I think if you do those uh, templates and just make sure that you, you meet the new reporting requirements uh, for those, so it's good to, you know, to, you know, to revisit. Um, we just move on here um, uh, uh, to touch on the net stable funding ratio. So finally, the net stable funding ratio uh, uh, you know, is is going live. Uh, you know, this has been around since since uh, CRR came in, uh, went live. I think on the thirty first of December twenty thirteen. So you know, six years or so now. So there's been a um, there's been a, a, a you know fi finally they have uh, uh, sort of agreed on what the, this calculation should look like. I know that many of you have reported it for several years. Uh, almost as a sort of memorandum to you know to the regulators, but now this has actually gone live, and you need to comply with a hundred percent net stable funding ratio requirement. Um, and I think what's really important here, and this will probably apply to quite a lot of building societies, is that uh, uh, firms are permitted to report NSFR on a simplified basis. Uh, uh, and to qualify as a simplified firm, you need to have a balance sheet of less than five billion euros, have no trading book. Um, and have no sort of derivative exposure. So basically, I think given most building societies have a very small uh, uh, trading book, if any, then the kind of five million euro threshold is important for you. Um, uh, so if you have that, then you can uh, uh, then you can um, uh, calculate the simplified uh, uh, um, uh, NSFR uh, um, ratio. Uh, using templates uh, uh, C82, C83, uh, uh, and C84. So it's a simplified calculation, which I think is great. Um, and, uh, uh, and so I would imagine most building societies will have to, you know, will end up using uh, uh, a C82 uh, uh, and C83 template. But if you uh, are about the five um, billion euro uh, uh, um, requirement, you'll have to use SEMP templates at C80 uh, and C81 uh, and, and, and which, it, you know, which is similar to the simplified, just a bit more complex and so more, more, um, more, you know, more details, uh, uh, more analysis required. Uh, so the regulators that are just trying to, you know, to implement some, some uh, um, uh, proportionality, which, which it, you know, I think is always a good thing. Um, 
So the next slide here, I just have some analysis um, around uh, uh, the NSFR templates. So uh, if we look at the fully fledged templates, uh, um, you know, you'll, you'll see there's really sort of three key blocks here. Uh, so you have the amount, which is like your accounting value, you have your factor. And this factor is really what you sort of apply to each line, uh, uh, you know, to calculate the, the you know, the NSFR, um, you know, ratio. And, uh, uh, um, and then, uh, you know, which is your kind of your, you know, your, you know, the factor that you, uh, uh, you know, you will apply. And then each block is then split into maturity buckets. So you have, you know, residual maturity less than six months, greater than six months to one year, and, uh, and equal to or less than one year. And then you also have to analyze your HQLA separately uh, 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 as these factors depend on residual maturity. And then if we look at C82 and C83, so the small firms, as I said earlier, uh, um, uh, the good thing about these templates is that uh, 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 you have two maturity buckets instead of three, so less analysis. Uh, and the breakdown of rows, as I said earlier, is it's much less detailed, so much easier for firms to calculate. And then also, I think some of the standard factors are, you know, may differ as well. So again, they just, you know, apply the more sort of broad brush approach to the standard factor. So again, this will make it simpler and easier for firms, uh, uh, you know, to calculate on the NSFR. And just finally, before we go into, to, um, you know, to um, uh, uh, sort of the last few minutes for questions, et cetera, um, I just wanted to, to, you know, to talk to some of the other changes and amendments uh, that will, um, that we'll see uh, as part of uh, a CRD5 and CRR2. Um, the uh, uh, regulators, because uh, uh, of the uh, 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 MREL uh, um, uh, going live uh, um, as part of the uh, uh, sort of resolution directive, some firms have MREL requirements and need to basically hold uh, eligible liabilities for, uh, for, you know, for MREL, the, you know, the regulators have introduced that as a separate asset class uh, uh, in the, you know, in the, you know, in the uh, various co-rep returns. If you have uh, uh, um, MREL uh, 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 eligible liabilities, you'll have to basically report those separately in the template, so additional asset class or exposure class for that, where, you know, where, irrelevant given that this is liabilities it's it doesn't really impact the co-rep template so much on on the asset side but it will certainly impact on things like some of the liquidity returns for example you know where you do report for your um you know your liabilities you have to include them there uh, there's been some minor changes to um you know to asset encumbrance um there's been been uh, um, uh, just to align it with the pillar three requirements uh, there's been some small changes to losses from immovable property. So, so for example, they're recognised on the, on the, on the, I think on the, on the uh, uh, annual rather than semi-annual basis, uh, and there'll be additional uh, reviews of that going forward. LEI codes have been harmonised. Uh, um, you know, small point, but again, it's I think it's it, it's just useful to notice. Um, there's been a couple of other changes to fin, you know, to fin rep as well, which I think goes in tandem with co -rep. So, for example, given that there's now an NPL backstop, as I spoke about earlier, for non-performing loans, that's been reflected in the, uh, you know, in you know, in FinRep, um, and uh, they're just trying to 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 uh, uh, um, I guess you know address a few further points around Q and As, for example, where specific things have been been been, um, been listed, but nothing fundamental. I think the main change on on the FinRep is the NPL backstop introduction. Um, there's a couple of things as well, which is more on the kind of CRD5 side rather than on the um, on the sort of co-rep and CRR. So the uh, uh, regulation now um, has introduced provisions for um, uh, for environmental and social and governance risks, so ESG as it collectively done. So all the UK banks have been asked by the PRA to set out, set out how they will assess and manage ESG risk. I'm not sure if that's been been asked to the building society sector as well. I, I, I would imagine so. I think it really much follows what what the you know where the regulators want you know you know want to go. That firm should assess you know how does ESG impact us. And the uh, uh, I think what's really interesting is that CRD five and CRR two has both has references to 
measures that focus on on uh, on things like sustainable finance. So uh, uh, you, you, know, you may end up, you know, uh, uh, seeing uh, 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 you know specific pillar one and pillar two treatment for ESG result in you know, re you know related risk eventually. So I think that's something that firms have started to look at in their ICATs and you know and talk about and trying to analyze ESG risk is very much on on the regulator's agenda. And I think they've also have the uh, right to, to you know, potentially uh, 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 set capital add-ons for ESG risk. I haven't seen that been done yet, but I know that's possible. Um, and I think just finally, there is some, some um, uh, you know, there's a, um, there's a new rule for in intermediate parent undertakings for third country groups. So basically, if you're a third country group that has several entities in the European Union, you need to you know, create an EEU, EEA intermediate holding company. I don't think this will be relevant at all for any building societies. I'm not, I, I saw that I'm aware of, I thought I could just mention it because it does impact uh, uh, some larger banking groups in the, um, in the UK. So, so that's really all I wanted to, uh, you know, to cover. Um, I have a, a slide here with some key takeaways, uh, uh, which I think is really uh, important for you, particularly in the regulatory reporting space. Just to kind of you know, review the draft technical standards that's come out uh, um, in the um, in the uh, uh, sort of appendix to this deck that we'll send out after the meeting, you'll see all the technical references uh, to what I talk about. So you can you can have a look at those and familiarise yourself. Um, I think you need to determine also if you want to fall under any of the proportionality exemptions. So for example, uh, around NSFR, I would imagine it's 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 useful to, um, you know, for you to check if you can use the sort of simplified approach. Same with the, with, you know, with the counterparty credit risk. Also see, are there any sort of data challenges that these templates may present based on your current reporting tools? So for example, can you calculate the uh, non-performing loan backstop, you know, with your current reporting tools or, the, or do you need to do some extra work? Um, and I think also, with, this is quite important that, you know, Given that there are changes here, it, 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 you know, to the kind of the way capital is calculated, you know, make sure that you review your internal limits and early warning indicators, risk appetites, etc. So you basically capture these requirements. So I talked about non-performing loans earlier. You know, do you have SME and infrastructure loans, for example? You know, if the uh, supporting factors are changing, then that means that perhaps you need to change your risk appetite for those. Uh, same with the NSFR and leverage ratio. Uh, and I guess also uh, on the large exposure side as well, given that, that calculation is now more strict, does that impact any of your large exposures, uh, uh, you know, monitoring? So that's really all I wanted to say. I think we have uh, uh, um, 11 minutes or so left for questions. We're all, we've already taken uh, some questions, but happy to, you know, to you know, take a few more, more questions from the floor. Thanks, Ivan. Um, I've got a couple which have come up through the Q&A. Um, first one is uh, goes back to the um, what you covered on IRRBB. So just yep. very simply, do you expect any IRRBB requirements around uh, NII, net interest income risks, as well as EVE? Yes, yeah, so I think there will be uh, uh, the regulators. Uh, 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 I think they've expect firms to discuss it in their, um, you know, in their ICAP. But I don't think there'll be a requirement to calculate or hold any sort of pillar two capital for that at all. I think that will very much be based on the uh, uh, on the Eve, which is what we use at the moment in FSA 17. Okay, thanks. And another one that's just come up: um, Does the uh, FinREP NPL apply to all firms, or are there thresholds? That's a good question because I think. On FinREP, there is a threshold if you're under a certain size. Um, and I have the feeling, and again, I need to confirm this, but I have the feeling that these MPL uh, 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 sort of additional analysis that is in those templates for firms that are above that threshold. But that's something we can confirm. I okay. can add that to the, you know, to, you know, to, you know, to the slides. I'm making notes. Put that, that on the slides. That'd be really yeah. good. Thanks. And there's a further one, um, very important question. And actually, it really relates to the whole question of what the PRA itself is going to do, where there are things in CRR2 or CRD5 that come in in June, yeah. whether they're actually going to go ahead with them as, as planned. So the question is, are we aware of the process to acquire the proportionality exemptions? Like, is there a standard form we send into PRA or 
who speak to the PRA supervisor. And I suppose what this is around is everything to do with um, what they call the small and non-complex banks yes, uh, yes. treatment. And I suppose the answer is we don't know because until we see PRA coming clean about what they're going to do, we don't know what the process will be. So I'm afraid, I suspect this means just sit on your hands for the moment. Yes. Or I think, or all time table, if you sort of, uh, um, I mean, you can discuss it with your regulator. I, I, I've seen some some banks have done that already around the property now. I saying, yeah, we think we'll be, um, no, we'll, you know, we'll, you know, we'll be in, you know, below the threshold. Yeah. Uh, uh, so they have sort of raised that practically, you know, with a regulator. That's an option as well. But you are right. They, you have to sit on the fence until uh, 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 all of this is confirmed. I mean, one, one thing that happens to be going on in the background is that the, the PRA itself has got their own thinking about doing a, an even more ambitious um, proportionality uh, exercise yeah. to uh, lead to something that's going to be called strong and simple or simple and strong or strong but silent or some, some kind of uh, terminology like that. Yeah. Uh, simpler, not weaker. So yeah. what the approach we're taking is we want to see the SNCB provisions in CRR2 should be the baseline and we want PRA to do better. So yeah. I'm hoping that there won't be, um, uh, that, they, that they won't fall short, but yeah. if anything, they might do more. So that's just um, yeah. our expectations. Yeah. yeah. But I think my, my expectation is that the kind of the firms that sit below these thresholds, there's no, there wouldn't be any difficulty uh, uh, or, or sort of getting that permission from the PRA to, you know, to, you know, to, you know, to get into that yeah. cohort. Yeah. Yeah. But I think you're absolutely right. I think there's more work to do around provisionality, and I think that's something they're I think they're exploring post Brexit. You know, if there's yeah. parts of you know the kind of the financial services in industry that will fall, you know, or will have lighter regu you know, regulation. So, yeah. so, 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 so yeah. um, I think that's um, yeah, yeah. That, I, I, I think that's encouraging, and you know, you know, at least for some smaller firms, whether you know where where there's lower risk. Uh, and I mean, I mean, we have seen the PRA has been, you know, encouraging that. I mean, some of the smaller banks and buildings that I know with, for example, they have used, you know, credit risk offsets in, you know, pillar two calculations, for example, just, you know, just to make sure that firms that are small don't get sort of unfairly punished for you know, just, just, just for being small and simple. Yeah, yeah. Now, there's one other question that's come up. Um, yeah. The earlier drafts of CRD suggested that, and I think this, this may in fact also relate to what's supposed to be coming in through Basel IV, calculating risk-weighted assets for mortgage as for mortgage loan assets yep. should be based on the original house price value at completion, not using HPI, which is how we currently do the calculation. So it's yep. the LTV at original valuation point. Yep. And my recollection was that that's actually all in Basel IV. Yes. And isn't, isn't part of any of this at the moment. That's, that, that's correct. It's, I think as part of Basel IV, there's a wider package Yes, I think of uh, uh, risk weights for uh, for uh, 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 you know the whole calculation of uh, basically exposures to you know uh, yeah. you know to, you know to mortgages and housing etc. So yeah, it's part of that. So it's the next the next train. Yeah, next round. I think that's you know be quite you know more much more uh, uh, I guess important for you know the building society sector. You know where you'll yeah. have uh, uh, for example splitting out you know buy to let and you know, yes. and, and, yeah. uh, and, and normal lending, et cetera. So, so um, yeah, yeah, it's part of that package. And there's another question, which is to do with Pillar 3. Yeah. Um, the understanding is that there are changes to Pillar 3 disclosures. Um, and if that's the case, do they take effect from December 2020, year end, or 2021? Because they're a sort of once a year thing. So, um, yeah, I think not they're, remember they're whether so the yeah, there's certainly changes coming in 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 um, in 2020. I'm not sure which, which exactly which changes they uh, related because these are I think there's three phases to this. Oh, there's gosh. certainly changes coming in. <laughs> yeah, in in you know in you know in December 2020, absolutely. Uh, uh, and I think again, you just have to look at the proportionality because there are certain exemptions for smaller firms. That's it. I um, thought the SNCBs get a bit of a carve out on pillar three. Yeah, absolutely. So oh, I think so it that, depends on yeah yeah so, so 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 I think that again you have to look at the kind of proportionality and you know if you're a small non-complex uh, 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 business then um, yeah there will there will be exemptions uh, okay. for you yeah 
And last question at the moment, uh, which is quite a complex one. So let's see if I get this right. So for NPLs, non-performing loans, yeah. if the requirements to hold capital or provisions increase over time, are there specific rules relating to recovery periods? Because it seems counterintuitive that more provisions are required when the risk is going down as the customer is back on track, but only for a short period. You know, so if the guy starts paying again and you're actually yeah. increasing the capital or provisions, why is that smart? Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of don't know the answer to that at the top of my head, to be honest. <laughs> uh, 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 I think it's more like almost like an accounting, uh, um, you know, question than a, than a, than the capital one, uh, uh, you know, to be honest. But I, yeah, I, I'll, 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 yeah, I don't really know what this. Well, what we could do is the could, logic for that. Yeah, we could maybe defer it because um, Mark Spencer is doing. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, is doing something on accounting for COVID and the whole question of um, impairment and so on uh, yeah. later on. So and we can deal with it offline. So yeah, that's, uh, I think it's very much an accounting, you know, an yeah. accounting question. I think the the uh, uh, Barca rules uh, uh, don't really consider that at all. Yeah. So I think at the moment we have answered all the questions that have come up, and time wise we're coming coming round to twelve thirty. So I'll say. If anybody else has any quick questions, um, I'll just keep it open for a minute or two. But I think my sense is that everybody wants to get to their lunch. So we'll close the questions there. And I just mentioned again that we've got um, the third video webinar um, is on the 16th of November, and that's around mostly accounting for COVID. So look forward to that. I think we've got about 35 or 40 people already signed up for that. Um, all it remains for me to do is to say um, great appreciation to BDO colleagues, to Ovind for um, hard work presenting for an hour on a fairly dry subject, and to Lauren for being in the background and making sure it all works, which it did, thank goodness. Uh, of course, I had complete confidence that it would. And as it's now practically 12.30, I think thank you all delegates for taking part and being very well behaved. And I'm sure you'll all be ready like me to pour a glass of something and have a snifter and then move on to your lunch. And with that, I will close the event. Thank you again.